Oi. Ever since WeWork's blown IPO, the markets and the media have been looking at the venture capital space in Silicon Valley a little more cynically. I mean, on top of WeWork's woes, you have Beyond Me, Uber, and the rest of the unicorns all experiencing a narrative shift. So what's the impact of all this change in the Silicon Valley venture capital space? Is this really the end for the unicorns? That's exactly what we're gonna talk about on this week's episode of The One Thing. What's going on investors, Drew here. AK's on vacation, so for now you're stuck with me. Recently, it seems like the tables are turning on Silicon Valley. With Facebook in trouble with Congress and WeWork's blown IPO, all of these stories of explosive growth seem to be at an inflection point. Real Vision recently interviewed Vincent Delaward. He's the director of global macro strategy for International FC Stone. He makes the argument that Silicon Valley and those unicorns are in for a rude awakening. Delaward points out that the problems facing Silicon Valley have implications for the rest of the economy. And here he is explaining that problem. I think it's the entire model uh, of the Bay Area economy of, um, kind of rising asset prices, uh, very high wages, most of that being uh, stock-based, uh, and very high real estate uh, prices. And it was somewhat of a virtuous cycle for, for most of the past 10 years. And with the uh, recent uh, slaughtering of the unicorn, I think we're starting, we're at the beginning of a massive unraveling uh, of this model. So Delaware has problems with the entire Bay Area business model. Rising asset prices, astronomical real estate costs, and stock-based compensation all point to this real concentration of wealth. But according to Vincent, WeWork is just the tip of the iceberg. I'll let him explain why. I think we're starting, we're at the beginning of a massive unraveling uh, of this model. WeWork is it's like the, well, for, WeWork is, not San Francisco, <laughs> uh, but it, it is the, the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you, you see the, the big public ones that, that catch everyone's attention, but I mean, the way Silicon Valley works is, is almost like a, like a pyramid scheme in a way, uh, where every, um, every valuation is based off someone else's valuation. So if one needs to take a ride down, then the entire chain uh, needs to work its way down. And then a lot of this wealth is on paper, you know, it's very hard to use traditional discounted cash flow models for companies that don't have cash flow or have cash flows that are very negative for as far as the eye can see. So you really have to price them off other deals. Um, and um, most of the bubble that, that we've seen, contrary to what happened in, in the late 90s in the private market. Um, but that being said, the IPO remained the end game, right? It's just been longer and longer. You had all these Peter Pan companies that, you know, have been funded, funded by private investors for, you know, five, ten years. I mean, you know, when it started, you only had series A, B, maybe C. I mean, now people are F, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and all these companies now, basically, the road to uh, public listing is, is now closed. Uh, and the large investors that could bring them that liquidity, uh, typically the vision fund, uh, are, are just not doing so well. A lot of them use leverage. Uh, so I think we are just at the beginning of the, on this unraveling, and I, I don't see a happy ending to this. Delaware points out that as these deals have begun souring for big VC firms like SoftBank, those firms are less likely to write these blank checks for the unicorns. Because the venture capital pricing models aren't based on cash flows, AKA reality, underwriters have to rely on comparable deals to assign proper valuations to these companies for their series A, B, C, D, you get the point. So when those deals start to go belly up, the Ponzi-like aspect that Vincent mentioned starts to rear its ugly head. Back in July, Real Vision had Josh Wolf of Lux Capital on to talk about exactly this issue. Here he is explaining. You know, a marginal buyer on the public equities who maybe was the corporation buying back its own stock. Yeah. In my world, the marginal buyer is two kinds. One, you've got SoftBank, which is setting a, you know, irrational price. They have an enormous amount of money to put to work and have put to work, pricing up their own stock. And we've talked on Real Vision before about this in the past with Mike. And so, so I think that they have created um, irrational comps that other people have referenced to that have set artificially high prices that are almost equivalent to leverage because a 10% or 20% down round wipes out everybody in that capital structure stack. It's a disaster for the valuation of your company when the valuation of the company that your valuation was based on suddenly and dramatically decreases. I mean, imagine being the Impossible Burger guys seeing Beyond Meat stock tank right after the IPO. So if you don't have any cash flows or frankly any other evidence to provide some benefit of the doubt to refute the comparison, 
what happens when the pricing model collapses? So you revert to the last pricing model. And unfortunately for a lot of these unicorns, that's a terrible sign. I mean, just look at WeWork. They went from a $47 billion valuation to a $7 billion valuation, getting bailed out of bankruptcy in like two weeks. Their lifeblood is this access to cheap capital. And when that pool runs dry, the industry is gonna change forever. But is this problem contained to Silicon Valley? What does it mean for the broader markets and economy? Here's Vincent again. Lack of profit is not just a unicorn startup -y phenomenon. If you look at the, the Russell 2000, about a third of Russell 2000 companies do not make profit. I actually, um, I counted, there was about 18% of the companies that lost money in 15 of the past 16 quarters. That's a significant number. They're not just tech startup or, or uh, biotech companies. And again, you have this, I mean, we have tax rates at the lowest they've been since, since the end of the war. We have the unemployment rate at the lowest it's been for, you know, again, the end of the war. I interest rates at about a 5,000 year low. And still you have a third of the market that cannot turn a profit in, under the circumstances. And at the same time, you've seen this explosion in debt per share. Uh, three, four X on, on the Russell 2000 since 2011. So you have all the ingredients for, a, a, I think, a major correction. So 18% of the companies in the Russell 2000 have lost money in 15 of the last 16 quarters. Despite the cheapest cost of capital in 5,000 years, there are still companies that can't figure out how to get profit. That unprofitability could be the kiss of death for any new financing. And that has major implications for the rest of the economy. I use the word contain because I want to remind you of the last time a financial issue had to be contained. Remember when Ben Bernanke said that the subprime problem was contained? Things are starting to smell a lot like 2008. Now, I'm not standing here telling you that the sky is falling and that history is repeating itself. What I am saying is that if these pricing models collapse, like Vincent said, those valuations are in for major corrections. These major corrections will bleed into the rest of the economy, considering how interconnected the modern financial system is, and that's a bad sign. So if you want help tracking that narrative, or you just wanna learn more about the venture capital space in Silicon Valley, subscribe to Real Vision. I'll talk to you next week.